This is Ezra chapter 4. I'm going to begin in verse 6. I'm going to read down through verse 24. It's quite a chunk of scripture. Beginning in verse 6. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam, and Mithridath, and Tabil, and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes the king as follows. Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, the men of Erech, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Oznapar deported and settled in the cities of Samaria, and in the rest of the province beyond the river. This is a copy of the letter that they sent. To Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greeting. And now, be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the royal revenue will be impaired. Now because we eat the salt of the palace, and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king in order that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. You will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from of old. That was why this city was laid to waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river, greeting. And now, the letter that you sent to us has been plainly read before me, and I make a decree, and search has been made. And it has been found that this city from of old has risen against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made in it, and mighty kings have been over Jerusalem." who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease, and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the herd of the king? Then, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem, and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Well, this is the word of God for the people of God this morning. Amen. We uh, pray together, and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you for your word. Um, Lord, it is a privilege to be together this morning and to hear from you. Lord, uh, you have said that your word is powerful, and that when your word goes forth, it does exactly what it was intended to do. And so, Father, we are we're, we're human. We, we, we don't know all of your intentions when you speak. And yet we know, Father, that you're a good Father, you're, you're a patient Father, um, you're just and you're kind, you're full of love and mercy and grace. And at your word, um, all things that exist uh, came into existence. And so we, we know that your, your word has power, um, power to convict, power to comfort, power to heal power to save. So God, I pray that you would come and do that and, and, and much more. Just, Father, just have your way among us, we ask. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You, you may be seated. 
have to uh, have to admit um, the week the week was a bit broken up because of the Thanksgiving holiday for me. Um, I'm sure it was similar for you too. Um, on top of that, this text, as you'll see here in a little bit, is a bit uh, problematic. Uh, it's, it's not the easiest text to jump into and preach. Um, first glance, when you take a look at this passage, I think it's a little bit confusing. Um, one reason it's a bit confusing is all the really hard to pronounce names. I can't tell you how many times I stood there in my office practicing pronouncing those names, and I'm pretty certain I got them at least halfway off, but I will say this. If I could have another kid, and Christy and I can't unless we adopted, I would definitely name him Shimshai because <laughs> dude sounds like a ninja, okay? So I would name him Shimshai. Um, that was my first takeaway from the text. Like, Laid my head down on my pillow and went, this is going to be rough this week, Lord. Please be with me. <laughs> a lot of hard to pronounce names. Um, it, it, when you read it, it feels choppy, too. As it doesn't feel like it really flows very well. And, and there's some reasons for that that we'll probably get into a little bit. The other thing that is probably, I think the thing that is the most problematic is there are some, the date range. Um, the date range of this text covers roughly about 100 years. Um, which feels, it, it feels weird. So you'll notice, if you were to look back, if you have your Bibles in front of you, you might notice at the end of verse 5, um, yeah, 4 and 5, it says that, you know, we know that they had some opposition going on, right? And when you look at verses 4 and 5, it says, the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah, made them afraid to build, and then verse 5, bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, okay? And so if you just take that very last thing, until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and you think about, boy, in, in the next few verses, next 23 verses or whatever it is, down to verse 23, he's talking about some other kings and the reigns of other kings. And then at the very end of chapter 4, verse 24, look what it says. It says, Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So the reality is, is you could take out verses 6 through 23, and here's the way it would read. And I'm doing this intentionally, okay? Here's the way it would read. It would read, I'm going to start in verse 4, and then I'm going to bounce over to verse 24. So if you have your Bibles, try to follow with me. I think this will help make sense. Verse 4, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. We just said Darius, right? Now jump over to verse 24. Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Those, that fits together. Because it tells you that the work of, of the work of God in rebuilding the temple stopped until the reign of Darius, until the second year of the reign of Darius. See how the thought continues? Now, in between there, in between verses 5, you, you'd say verses 6 to 23, it's a bit of a mess. And the reason it feels a bit of a mess is because of the range that is covered. If you were to take a look at the whole chapter, you would notice the names of four kings, Okay? You got King Cyrus in verse 5. You got King Darius in verses 5 and 24. Uh, you got King, weird name, Ahasuerus, which I'll just tell you now is actually King Xerxes from the book of Esther. Esther. Okay, that's who that is. And that's in verse 6, right? And then you have King Artaxerxes mentioned throughout verses 7 through 23. Now, the reign of those four kings, if you were to combine all their reigns together, covers a, a period of time that's almost 100 years. Um, so it's like, what's going on here? It feels weird. It's like, it's like when, uh, when, when the author, when Ezra um, stops talking about Darius, King Darius in verse 5, and then he jumps back to him again in verse 24, it's almost like he's talking about a certain season, but then he just pauses maybe. Um, I think it's also helpful, let me come back to that thought in a minute. Um, it's also helpful to think about the story itself that's been happening, okay, in, in the context uh, from chapter 1 until now. If you kind of take a look at the narrative, kind of the blow-by-blow blow for a few minutes, um, here's what you see. You might, you might remember. 
One of the first things we saw happen in chapter 1 is God uh, speaking to and then through uh, a pagan king, right? Um, and then God sets the captives free is the next thing that happens in chapter 2. Um, and then in the first part of chapter 3, Israel rebuilds the altar. So this is just kind of a blow-by-blow action story going on. Um, and then in the second part of chapter 3, Israel actually begins to rebuild the temple after they've built the altar. So they were in captivity for 70 years. They get set free. They rebuild the altar. They're starting to rebuild the temple. Uh, and then in last week's text, as we looked at the first five verses of chapter 4, there was a ton of opposition. Israel's enemy started to rise up against them and begin to uh, accuse them, begin to, um, begin to oppose them. And at the end of last week, in verse 5, we saw, because of that opposition... Because Israel gave in, fearfully, um, what God wanted to build in and through them came to a screeching halt. Um, Now our current passage, when you look at the current passage in front of us, I think what it's meant to do is it's meant to show us just how bad the opposition really was, number one. And number two, it's meant to show us how long the opposition was lasted. So again, when you look at the text, I think what's happening is Ezra is basically pressing the pause button on the current kind of a blow-by-blow narrative or storytelling. Um, And then, and and as he does, as he presses pause, he steps out of that blow-by-blow and steps into a, here's here's, here's a century-long detour. Does that make sense? Um, sometimes you see this in movies, right? A lot of times in movies, you'll, you'll be watching the movie, and you'll be clipping along, you know, especially the Hallmark movies today. The chick always breaks down in the car somewhere and meets some Romeo somewhere, and oftentimes you, you get the backwards look at what's happened um, in her life or his life. But then sometimes they might pause and get this glimpse of the what if, you know, like the well, what if they got together? It could look like this. Or, well, actually, what, what if he just decided he didn't want to be married and then she went and married the guy that owned the horse park down the road? Yeah, I mean, it just, it's always the same story over and over again. But sometimes you do get that pause in the midst of it, right? Where it kind of gives you a, a look ahead of either what's coming or what could happen. I think that's what Ezra is doing is giving not a what if, <laughs> In our case, it becomes a what-if, but in their case, it's actually just true history. This is what happened over the next 70 or more years, nearly a century. And then after he gives that, in verses 6 to 23, then in verse 24, he comes right back to right now. Does that make sense? That's what I think is taking place in the text. Now, there's, I'll tell you, there's all sorts of scholarly arguments over all of this. And it drives me batty because I like things to be black and white and I like people to get along and I like people to stay like in a box and just be able to go, this is what happened. And it does make sense to me, but there are people who disagree with that take. So you can do the research on your own. The question though is why does Ezra go through the trouble of inserting a century of history into this chapter? Right? That's the question. Why does he do that? Why is it so important? And really, for me, as much as I just kind of want to jump to the end and go, I think this is the reason why, it's, I think it's important for us to drill down into the text a little bit before we answer that question. Um, what I want to do then is I want to answer the what and then the why. So I just want to answer the what is happening in the text question, and then I want to jump from there to the why is this important question. Okay? So track with me. What's happening in the text? Let's go there first. Um, think about last week, too, as we, as we think about the text this week. <clears throat> last week, when we looked at the text, and what I talked about last week was our old adversary, right? Our old adversary, our enemy, the devil. Um, we, we, it was easy to make that connection because that was the term that Ezra used, I think, in verse 1. said, now when the adversaries of Judah... And Benjamin, then they oppose them. That word adversary is a direct correlation to our old adversary, the devil. What do we know about him? 
We know that Satan is a roaring lion, right? We know that he seeks to steal, to kill, and to destroy the work of God in us and through us, right? We know these things. We know that our adversary, Satan, the devil, we know that he is the accuser of the saved. We know that he works overtime, right? Day and night to undermine the power of God in our lives. We also know that he oftentimes does work through other evil human agents, right? I mean, the scriptures teach us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but oftentimes our enemy uses flesh and blood to make war against us. And as we looked at that last week, we learned that what what Satan will do is oftentimes he'll try to get into your business and try to subtly befriend you, right? You're, You're having a rough day? Just get smashed. Drink a little bit more, right? You feel lonely? Go get involved in an illicit relationship. Um, this will be helpful to you. He tries kind of that subtle approach first. And if that doesn't work, in Israel's case, that didn't work. If that doesn't work in yours and I's lives, then the very next approach that Satan will take is an all-out blast against you. And he'll just come full force against you in all-out aggression, Right? So we kind of saw that last week. Um, The text in front of us today, what we're looking at today, all it is, as I said, I think is it's a pause in the action of the history that Ezra is recounting. What Ezra does is he pauses this kind of blow-by-blow narrative and he shifts back and kind of hovers above and takes a look forward into the next century. And I think the reason he's doing this is he wants to illustrate or paint the picture or describe the extent of the opposition that lies ahead for Israel. Like, I I do think that as believers, we sometimes can give Satan way too much credit. This is going back to, I think, C.S. Lewis's argument as well. We do have a tendency to give him too much credit, but oftentimes we also probably don't give him credit enough. Like, we don't don't prepare ourselves enough for the fight against our enemy. I think that's kind of what Ezra is doing here, is just showing that, hey, your enemy really is a scoundrel. He really is after you, and it would be good to prepare yourself for that. At the end of the day, I think what he's trying to do is describe that. The extent of the opposition that lies ahead for Israel. How often do you think about the opposition that lies ahead of you when you make a decision? Whether right or wrong decision. Because there will be opposition either way. Make a right decision to honor God and you will be opposed. Make a decision not to honor God in something... And you still will be opposed. Consequences and the outcome are different. And I think the ramifications of those decisions can last for at least hundreds of years, right? If not longer. So we must never uh, underestimate the extent that the enemy will go to just to destroy the work of God in us and through us. I think at, at the same time, uh, as we do rightly estimate the extent that the enemy will go through, will go to, we also can't underestimate the power of God. And I think that's part of the problem in the text, too, is that Israel underestimated the power of God in the face of the opposition. So what's happening in the text? Right? What's happening there? Well, what extent does the enemy go to just to stop the work of God in and through Israel. But you notice first, and this is another partial problem with the text. Um, the first thing you probably maybe didn't notice right off the bat is that there's actually three letters mentioned in the text. Again, there's disagreement over that. Um, depends on the con- depends, depends on the uh, not context, but the construction of the sentences in the original language. And that's where another issue comes, is that at this point, the construction of the Old Testament is typically done in Hebrew. But you'll notice here that these letters were actually written not in Hebrew anymore, they're written in Aramaic. So now you're dealing with a completely different language, okay? So hopefully you can feel a little bit of my pain (laughs) in trying to interpret and study through this text this week. 
Um, at the end of the day, I'm going to land here and just say, I believe there's three letters mentioned. That gives you a picture of the extent of the opposition, right? That, that, that Israel's enemies actually took the time to write three different letters. I don't know if any of you have ever received a letter that kind of was from an adversary or somebody who opposed you or didn't like you, wasn't happy with you, but that ain't fun, is it, right? You get a text message or an email or a Facebook message or a letter in the mail. Um, those aren't fun. This enemy, I think, wrote three. Um, here's the reason I say that. So just so you can see my line of thinking, so you can understand, okay, this is why our pastor landed here. I think the first letter that is mentioned uh, is in verse 6, okay? That letter is written during the reign of Ahasuerus, uh, and that's King Xerxes. Um, now, when I say first, second, or third, I should be careful with that, too, because I just remembered in my mind that I never went back and actually did the work of figuring out which king served before and after the other. So I'm just going to say, first letter I'm going to note is the one that is mentioned in verse 6, um, and that's to King Xerxes from the book of Esther. Um, and then second letter, I believe, is mentioned in verse 7, okay? Uh, that letter is written by three dudes. You'll notice their names if you're looking at your Bibles. Their names are Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabeel, right? And then the rest of their associates. And that one is during the reign of Artaxerxes. So it's like Artaxerxes gets two letters, I think. Because the other letter that's written, the third one that's written, is mentioned in verses 8 through 16, and we have a copy of it. <coughs> <coughs> that one is not written by <coughs> the guys who wrote the second letter. Okay? This one is written by Rehum and Shimshai. So there, I think there are three letters. Again, what good does that do us today in terms of our study? I think that it might just simply illustrate the, the amount of opposition that comes against us. So I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you're wrestling with some kind of sin or you're wrestling with um, some kind of difficulty in this life, some kind of suffering, some kind of shortage, some kind of loss. And at times you, you think, man, if I could just get to the other side of this, it would be good. And you get to the other side of that and maybe you're good for a few weeks and then you realize, oh, snap, <laughs> the enemy's back again, right? Um, I just think it's good to notice that our, our old adversary, the devil, he's been at this for a long time. And the idea that he just continuously throws things at you all the time is something for us to be aware of. But at the same time, we must not underestimate the power of our God, right? I think that's kind of the key thing in the midst of all this. I think the other thing you can see in this, um, and this is an interesting thing that I noticed um, is that our enemy definitely loves to use words, right? Which does make sense because God speaks. God's word is powerful. So what would his adversary do? Ultimately, Satan is not necessarily our adversary. He's more of God's adversary. So uh, what would Satan do? Try to emulate that. From the very beginning in the garden, what did he do? He got Adam and Eve to question God's word. And so I, I think you can see this, that, that, that our enemy definitely loves to use words. And when he uses those words, I'm sure you've noticed this in your life, our adversary, our enemy, loves to use words that wound and weaken us so that he can then intimidate us, so that he can then stop the work of God in and through us. I think that's kind of what we see happening. Again, I think uh, Ezra chooses the third letter um, as his illustration so that he can illustrate the extent of the enemy's accusations. There are a few things about the letter that I think are important to note. I'm not going to get down in the weeds on all of the text in the letter. You, you can do some of that work yourself, and it is kind of fascinating. But I think using some broad brushstrokes... If you uh, broke the text down this way, if you looked at verses 9 and 10, I think what you notice in those verses uh, is you would, you would notice the size of the enemy, right? 
It's not just a couple of dudes who wrote the letter. There's actually this long list of people that they have in their camp with them. It almost gives you a feeling like everybody is against Israel, right? They list this nation, that nation, this tribe, that tribe, this person's name, these officials and those officials, and these associates here. It just feels like the entire world is opposed to Israel. Uh, If you looked at uh, verses 13 through 16, and you did kind of a deep dive into those words there, uh, I think you would see what I would call the pervasiveness of the accusations. What do I mean when I say the pervasiveness of the accusations? Uh, You could say the extent, right? The extent of the accusations. I mean, they're being accused of being a totally rebellious nation, right? They're being accused of... Um, it's a character assassination. That would be a way to look at it, too. Um, it's like, hey, hey, if these guys actually do rebuild their city, O king, they're not going to pay you anything. In fact, they're probably going to take over, and you're going to lose power. The pervasiveness of that character assassination, that accusation, that sounds like, sounds like somebody else, if you know what I mean. It sounds like somebody else speaking. You know what it's like when, you, when you're in those moments where Satan comes and he whispers into your heart, like, you are a no good loser. Okay. It's, those, it's that kind of character assassination from the enemy that I think is taking place there. And it's, it's, the, it's the pervasiveness of those accusations that caught my attention. The third thing that I think I notice in, in, in this letter, too, Um, And it's really all throughout, all the way from especially verse 11 through 16. Um, It's the flattering and deceptive nature of the enemy, right? Like when when the enemy wants to get after you, who who are they going to? They're going to the king. They're writing a letter to the king. You might remember that who is our accuser before the throne of God? Satan, right? Satan is the one who will accuse us. You might even see this in the book of Job where uh, Satan comes before God and speaks to him, right? He's the one accusing Job. Um, he's saying, hey, Job, Job's going to fail. Job's going to fail if you lift your hand off of him a little bit. That's what Satan does. And I think when you get that in your mind's eye, when you know that Satan is the one who's accusing you before the king who sits on the throne, and if you begin to believe that the things that he's whispering in your ears are true, and that he can get to your king, your God, your father in heaven, and he can get him to believe the same thing about you that he's saying, then it puts you in jeopardy, and you start thinking, I wonder what my standing with God is right now. Now, I don't think that thinking that way is necessarily wrong. I think it can be good for us to think about, hey, how am I doing with God right now? Definitely good, right? But I think it stands to reason that the fear that we might walk under at times is would God listen to Satan's voice as he accuses us? Especially if there's a hint of truth there. I mean, there are hints of truth to what the enemy is saying about Israel. They were definitely at times, as a very small nation, a force to be reckoned with. Read the book of Joshua and you'll see. So that's what I think is kind of going on in the text. Underneath all of that, what I think is happening is you can see that the enemy definitely knows how to use his words to wound and weaken and intimidate the people of God, right? I mean, notice, notice again, think about it. The enemy uses their words to cause Israel to believe that everyone, even all the other surrounding nations, are actually opposed to them, right? Right? What is that? What, what translates out of that? You might feel this in your life. They are completely alone. Nobody wants them. Like when you face hard things in life, when you face opposition, one of the first tactics of the enemy at times is to cause you to feel like you are alone. You are unwanted. You're not useful. I see Satan doing this through those enemies in this text. Notice how the enemy uses their words to flatter the king, right? I mentioned that. Think about that again for a minute. 
they use their words to flatter the king with friendly words. And as they kind of suck up to that king, they, they spread lies about Israel's intentions to somehow rebel against the king. Like the enemy is literally accusing Israel before the throne of the most powerful human in the world. That's what's taking place. <coughs> Who do you have to go before you in that throne room when Satan comes to accuse you? What do you trust in in those moments? This is what Donnie was talking about just a little bit ago when it comes to justification. You know how hard it is to hold on to the truth that you've been justified You've been made right. <clears throat> that the declaration over your life by the king of the universe is not guilty. I don't care where you land on the Kyle Rittenhouse thing. But I'll tell you the moment that they read off the not guilty verdict time and time and time again, watching his response in that courtroom the way he broke down, do, do you know what that scene will look like in the courtroom of heaven after having a list of accusations against you read by your old enemy, the devil? And the old enemy is saying, he's guilty. And you know that at least half of what Satan's going to say about you is probably going to be true. Right? And you just be standing there underneath the weight of that, thinking, ah, I mean, if I'm in Kyle's shoes, I, don't, I just don't know how that young man walked through that. In that moment in heaven, after he gets done reading his list, you know who steps in next for you if you've trusted in Jesus? The Holy Spirit steps in because he's your advocate. And he goes, no, wait, wait, Your Honor. Um, I have a witness. <laughs> and he calls a witness. Jesus comes in. He sits up there and he goes, it's not guilty. I gave him my perfection. I'll take all of his consequences. And that's when the Father declares, you're justified. You're not guilty. So here's what your enemy and my enemy would love. Our enemy would love for us not to hang on to that courtroom scene. Our enemy would love for us not to hear that word from God. And he would love for us to listen to his words, his accusing words, his destructive words. That's what our enemy would love. Why? Because it would short-circuit the work that God wants to do in you. This is why I'm so passionate about telling people that they need to be in church every Sunday and that they need to be in small groups throughout the week. Who else do you have speaking the word to you other than your family, the church family, and your pastors? But like, why would you ever want to short circuit the ability to hear from God in those ways? All you do is you skip out on what God has for you, and you leave yourself vulnerable to hear words from your enemy. So the words of the enemy in this letter, along with the other letters that were written and sent, they, they did the trick. They did the trick for sure. The king in Persia ruled in favor of the enemy. And the building of the temple came to a screeching halt. The work of God comes to a standstill because the words of the enemy absolutely wounded, absolutely weakened, and absolutely intimidated God's people. My question is, where do you feel this tension, this pressure in your life right now? Where, where do you feel the words of the enemy making inroads into your heart and your mind? In what ways has the enemy used his words to wound and weaken and intimidate you? I mean, I, I will be honest with you. One of the key areas of my life over the last couple of years has been a few of our seven children who don't trust in Jesus. That's been one of the key areas that Satan continuously gets into my heart, oftentimes totally unseen as he deceives his way in. 
oftentimes the outcome of that is I sin in so many weirdly despicable ways. And as I trace that back to those wounds and that weakness and that pain and that intimidation, that's one of the ways. And he's been after me for the last few years. I don't know what your story is. Why does this story matter, right? That's the next question. Why does this story matter? Why does Ezra insert a century of history into the narrative at this point? Again, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but just to recap a little bit, I think Ezra is painting the picture of the next century of opposition so that he can unveil the fact that God's enemy will stop at absolutely nothing to oppose God. And that he will continue to oppose God long into the future as he attempts to stop the building of God's kingdom. And he does this through flattery. And he does it through outright deception. And he does it through outright bold attack on your life. And while it may be true that Israel... uh, definitely underestimated the size and the scope of the enemy's campaign against them, uh, Israel definitely also underestimated the power of God. And you can see that they underestimated the power of God as they turned away from what God had actually called them to do. They underestimated the power of God in the face of the enemy's words and the building of the temple stopped. I think that's why this is important. I think that's why Ezra puts this in here. Like, when was the last time you remember underestimating the power and providence of God? When was the last time? See, if it's true, if it's true that the Christian life is full of conflict and full of opposition, then I also think it's true that we live in a world of what I would say is estimation and evaluation. Big thought. If it's true that all this conflict exists, then we definitely also live in a world where we must estimate and evaluate. We must estimate and evaluate every step we take on the Christian journey, right? If you think of that book, uh, story, Pilgrim's Progress, that's a children's book. Some of you have heard me use the illustration before. I remember I read that book with our kids and our family Multiple times throughout that book, I would just weep and bawl like a baby. And especially the end. Oh, especially the end. When he throws off the, the weight and he throws off the crutches. And he's running into heaven. But the journey is hard. That's the point. And every step must be evaluated. Every step must be estimated. We must count the cost of our calling. I think all too often, especially in the American church today, uh, we, 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 we preach a light gospel message that is crossless. Um, we, we turn carrying our cross into political campaigns, you know? We, we turn carrying our cross into like social justice stuff. We, we turn carrying our cross into Picking fights with people that we don't like. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's nuts how we do that. And in doing so, we stop counting the actual cost of the calling, of actually carrying our crosses like Christ would have us. Which means making war against myself. Much less than war against the world outside of us. I think we're called to reach that world and make war against our sin. I'm pretty sure that's a big theme in Scripture. That doesn't mean you won't have social outcomes and political outcomes. True. But at the end of the day, when we underestimate the power and the providence of our God, what will we experience? We will experience seasons of stunted growth, just like the Israelites in our text. And I think underestimating our God is probably as common as getting dressed in the morning, right? I mean, I asked you a little bit ago, When was the last time you remember underestimating the power of God? I think underestimating him, for me at least, and maybe I'm just like a unicorn, I assume that my experience is the same as everybody else's. 
not to just lay that on you guys, but I, when I, just in my reading of Scripture, it seems like that is the bold confession of believers, or at least the life of believers all throughout the Bible, underestimating the power of God, right? This is why Abraham, twice not once, which I can't believe didn't land him in a friggin' divorce, twice not once gave his wife up as his sister, if I remember right. Um, you know, I mean... This is why David takes off at the girl from the rooftop next door, underestimated the power of God. I mean, it's over and over. This is why Peter denied Christ three times. This is why none of the heroes of the Bible are actually heroes, and there's only one hero. His name is Jesus, because he's the only one that got it right. So I think this whole underestimating God thing is as common as putting our clothes on in the morning. A couple of uh, illustrations and ways I've seen this happen in my own life and in others. We see the shortage in our bank accounts. Right? We see that shortage. We see the opposition. Bank account is low. What do I do? Cut back on my giving because I underestimate the power of God to provide. What's the result? The result is malnourished faith. Uh, feel the years of loneliness. Years of loneliness maybe in singleness or maybe you're in a difficult marriage. You feel those years of loneliness, separation. So you look for love in the wrong places. There's a country western song about that. We could stand to learn a lot from country western songs, by the way. <laughs> you look for love in all the wrong places, right? Illicit relationships, pornography, etc., whatever it may be. Why do we do that? Because we underestimate the power of God's presence. Somehow his presence isn't good enough. Um, so we look for it elsewhere. What's the result there? Constant desire to escape through addiction rather than finding comfort in the arms of Christ? Um, now what about this, this last one? I, you experience years of fighting against temptation. Right? I don't know what your specific sin is. Like We all got more than we probably care to admit. But I think for all of us, there's at least like one or two that feels like it's a constant struggle. Right? It's that one thorn in the side that just... Ugh, you can't wait for heaven because that thorn will be gone finally. Experience years of fighting that, though fighting the temptation, fighting sin. And I think what happens is sometimes, and I, this has been my experience, you underestimate the power and the providence of God in salvation. You give in to some kind of momentary pleasure, right? You believe that there are no long-term effects lying ahead. And pretty soon you find yourself in a cycle spinning out. These are just some of the ways that I think we undermine or underestimate the power of God. This really is, I think, the problem that Israel was facing in this text. Israel had underestimated the power and the providence of God in the face of the enemy's opposition. The words of the enemy had wounded them, had weakened them, and had now intimidated them. And the result is that God's restoration plan came to a screeching halt for about 17 years. But the opposition continued well into our time now, right? You could say that according to the text, lasted well into a century. That's why I think this is important. That's why I think Ezra put this in here. How do you conclude all of that? I want to conclude this way. Basic and simple, I think. Um, as I thought about this text, thought about the different themes, um, I got to thinking, I wonder if you know, if hindsight really is 2020, which I oftentimes find out that it is, I'm sure many of you have experienced that. If hindsight really is 2020, then what would some kind of foresight do for us? Just some kind of look ahead, right? Like what we see happening in the text. I think that's where Ezra was at. Ezra was a man of God's word. He was a preacher man. And I think, I think the Holy Spirit really gave him something here. What would foresight do? You could say vision. Vision for the future. What would that do for us? How helpful would that have been to me? If I could have seen the damage, if I could have seen the long-term effects of my choices 20 years ago, right? I've been walking with Jesus now. It'll be almost 22 years here and coming up in June. So it's been 21 years. If I could have seen I could have seen all the long-term effects of my rebellion and my disobedience and my running. I could have seen it then, not only on my life, but on my children's lives. 
would it have changed anything? Would something have been different in my life? If I, if I knew that my decisions to underestimate the power and providence of God back then were going to have these kinds of consequences today, how would it have changed things? And there's the reality. I can think that way all day long, and it is what it is. Here I am today, and here you are, right? Um, only God knows what I would have done 20-some years ago. Only God knows what you would have done. Um, here's what I do know. I know that it never hurts to learn from a country song. No, that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> it never hurts to learn from history. Uh, history is good for that reason. It teaches us a little bit. I think history oftentimes does have a sanctifying. When I say sanctifying, I mean transforming or growing effect on us. I also know this. I know that despite the Israelites' decision to underestimate the power of God, God's plan of redemption still moved forward uninhibited. Nothing stopped that. God's going to do what God's going to do because nothing changes what God's going to do because nobody or nothing can change God, right? Right? People who paid the price in this were the Israelites. People who pay the price for sin, in some regard, consequences, when I'm talking about that, it's really us and future generations that reap the benefits of that. And yet, at the same time, here's the thing that I love about the story of the gospel, that Jesus paid that price. He took the full weight. You and I may face consequences here and now, and generations ahead of us, our kids and our grandkids, may face some consequences as well. But at the end of the day, ultimately, eternally, Jesus came. Jesus still lived the perfect life that you and I could not. He still displayed and still does display the awesome power of God. Not only in his life, but in his death and in his resurrection, and in his ascension, and then in his promised return, right? So think about it. Israel may have failed to build the temple with courage because they were wounded, they were weakened, and they were intimidated by the words of the enemy. That is true. What's also true is that you and I have probably failed epically in some of the same ways, right? And probably still will fail some more the moment we walk out the door. Especially when the enemy's words get the best of us. But the good news and the thing that encourages me is that Jesus never failed in these ways. He's still building his church, God's earthly temple. <clears throat> and he's doing it with the broken and redeemed lives of believers just like you and I, right? At the bloody cross is where we find our redemption. The empty tomb is where we find our strength and our power. The promise of heaven is where we find our hope. So when you think about those things, my, my final encouragement to you is, if you walked in here in some way underestimating the power of God, you can confess that, to your Father in heaven and ask Him to give you strength. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to remind you of your sonship or your daughtership. That's not really a word, but ask Him to remind you of that. What if you came in here and you were underestimating the power of God and part of that is because you're not actually following Him. You bought into some Americanized Christianity that says you can kind of do whatever you want and read your Bible every once in a while. Maybe you're not even following him. Maybe, maybe you're a different kind of prodigal and you're just like way off the reservation, right? I never gave church and Bible a thought. Regardless of what camp or place you came in in this morning, if you find your place, you find yourself in that place of underestimating the power of God, I just want to encourage you. You can find a place at the foot of a bloody cross where your Savior, our Savior, gave his life for you for all the moments that we would underestimate his power. See, at the name of Jesus, the scriptures teach us, at his name, our enemy quivers and shivers in fear. Why? Because there's an anthem in scripture that is true. That anthem says that at the return of Jesus, every knee will bow 
and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Doesn't matter what the most powerful king on the face of the earth says, that king will bow to my king who died on a cross, left the tomb empty, and is going to come back for his bride one day. The sting of death will forever be quenched. And in that moment, and I can't wait to see this, the accusing voice, the words of our enemy, our adversary, the devil, they'll be silenced for all of eternity. That's what we look forward to. Amen? Would you stand with me? Father, thank you for your word. Pray, God, that you would continue to minister to us as we wrap things up this morning. I pray, Father, for anyone who did come in this morning questioning, underestimating your power, wondering when and if you're going to show up. Lord, I pray that you would show up, maybe not in a way that we hope you to right now, but you know, in a way that we never expected you to maybe right now, that you would do a work in our hearts and our minds and draw us close to you. Continue that work of restoration in each of us as building blocks in your temple where you live.